Rob, uh, welcome to Mining Now. It's good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Really I, uh, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite, I, I was trying to remember what episode it was asked because they had this amazing technology. It was quite a few episodes ago, so I can get away with saying it now. And I, I asked a question about putting it all these sensors and monitoring technology all together. And there wasn't a great answer. It was like, well, we hope so one day, but I'd say Hexagon is kind of uh, going that route if they haven't already done it. Yeah, that's it. We um, definitely having a good go at it. And uh, yeah, it's been some pretty exciting announcements coming out over the last six months or so. And it's something that we are definitely continuing to push the boundaries on and you know, really bringing all that tech stack together um, to really benefit the mining industry. Yeah, it's, it's I've, I've got a uh, crazy amount of stuff I want to ask you about, um, you know, projects, product lines, putting it all together. It's, yeah, it's, it's a lot to cover today. So before I do that, Rob, I got to step away and then give a shout out to our sponsors and then we'll, we'll get into it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Out to, to our sponsors for mine now, and we've got some great sponsors today, uh, Petro Canada Lubricants Products and Services. That's a Holly Frontier company. Um, are proven to maximize equipment performance, productivity, and overall savings. From heavy duty engine oils to hydraulic fluids, automatic transmission fluids, and gear oils and greases, Petrocanada Lubricants is committed to delivering innovative solutions that deliver value and keep business moving. They have dedicated technical expertise, knowledge, and, how, and know how to help customers in the mining industry operate smoothly with improved equipment, reliability, and performance. Learn more at lubricants.petro-canada.com or contact them at 1-866-335-3369 to arrange a call with one of their technical experts. EPCM, established in 1980. Uh, EPCM is a global engineering procurement and construction management firm. They deliver comprehensive solutions through EPCM engineering, EPCM automation, EPCM services, and supply and technical technologists cobra uh contact them to help you accomplish your goal please email info at epcm.com zero zero knox is the global leader in electrical electric powertrain solutions microgrids and clean technology they provide a platform for clean energy technology to come to market through powertrain solutions development partnerships and electrification kit solutions for Conversions, all powered by Zero Knox. Their mission is to empower communities through sustainable innovation as they partner with some of the world's leading OEMs to solve challenges across multiple continents with cleaner and higher performing technology, empowering a clean, innovative, and higher performing future without compromise. Learn more at zeronox.com. They did a great episode. Check that one out. And Savannah Equipment. Supplies new and used mine equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock to now take advantage of the high gold prices. Go to SavanaEquipment.com to do all their inventory. And remember, they list more equipment every day, SavanaEquipment.com. And Power Zone, when you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipeline dewatering or fuel handling needs, you want to visit Power Zone. Dot com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems to no matter the challenge, no matter the location, get in the zone with PowerZone, PowerZone.com. And last, but certainly not least, our partner and with their upcoming events, May 1st to 4th, CIM 2022 Convention and Expo is coming to Van Vancouver. Show off your products and service in mining technology, digital, digitalization equipment, consulting and engineering. There is a whole lot of perks waiting for exhibitors at this expo, and it will sell out fast. If you're a researcher thinking about what mining will look like for future generations, this convention is the perfect place to present your technical papers or lead a short course. Visit cim.org for all the details. Book your ex exhibitor space and submit your abstracts today. Thank you to all our sponsors. Rob, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to have Hexagon featured. It's uh, this, this uh, power of one conversation has been one that keeps emerging on our show. So it's glad to have a company that, that can represent what can be done. So welcome again to the show. Thank you. Look forward to it. Um, let, let's kind of get into this 
this uh, smart mind, which is is covering uh, um, so much ground and, and it's such a big topic. Can you just sort of lay it out for for what it is for from Hexagon's perspective and what you're sort of bringing to the table that that bird's eye view, if you will? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question, right? Because I guess you look at what's the definition of a smart mind. Mm. Um, and so many in the industry have different views, takes, ideas on that. Um, I think what we're looking at is how do we transform the mind into a, a digital uh, leader? You know, how do we take them from uh, what they've done today traditionally where it's a very manual process, um, trying to understand what's happening out in the field, take that and automate that process back into the office so that we can make smarter decisions, make those decisions faster, leverage that data and really put it to work, um, you know, to boost productivity, uh, boost efficiency, boost quality and safety um, within the mining industry. And I think leveraging technology that we've uh, developed and also you know, brought into the Hexagon family um, is really enabling us to, to run faster in that area. The process. It, it's 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 here and like like so many it's like when you see someone that's really successful you go oh and then you read their book that takes you know um you know if you're a reader like me it maybe takes you a couple of weeks to get, get through and you sit think you've got the story <laughs> of all these little details how does it even begin to come together i mean just i've done shows on just one tiny little part of monitoring a mind <laughs> Yeah, and hexagon is going. Oh, we put it all together. Um, easy thing to say. How do you choose the technology? How do you filter it out? Choose what's right. How to connect it, communicate it. I mean, where did it even start <laughs> to put it together? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was the easiest part there. It started in 2015 when our uh, CEO um, of the Hexagon AB came in and uh, identified a. You know, an industry needs to be looked at holistically on how we can shape that industry and how we can. Um, really help improve the lives of the people there. And he was all about, you know, his message was how do we connect the miners to the, from the, in the office, to the uh, pit, uh, to the boardroom, to make our lives easier. And it was a pretty easy and clear message as to this is what we need to do. Obviously, devil's in the detail. Once you, uh, you do start to get underneath that and you, you start to look at, the scope of and width and breadth of technologies or, or processes um, that we have within Hexagon, but even just in a mine site in general. And, you know, from mine planning or exploration into uh, the tech services team, into the production area, you know, making sure we do that safely. And um, you've got now a lot of stuff happening in around analytics to make better, you know, better decisions, um, autonomous technology stacks and, you know, all these sorts of areas. So I think um, what we started to do was really go out and work with our customers and identify what are their pains? What are the critical gaps that they have in the industry? We looked at what technologies we had um, and how we could apply those technologies or not. And then we started to either develop into the, the gaps into there or we um, started to but we looked outside and um, you know, brought some uh, other companies into the family to help build this message and this brand of what we're trying to achieve, which is, you know, shaping um, or the, going into that full digital reality sensors, uh, software solutions. So we, it's been a journey. I think the other big aspect is then, you know, working with some of these base technologies, we've got to you know, understand what the, some of the challenges are and then, bringing it forward into the 21st century, um, you know, leveraging some of the latest technologies that are available to us to really help uh, on this journey as well. So bringing in, like when you're, you're bringing on like a new product, is it, is it that you see gap, gaps, especially from your position? You know, obviously it's a, a different company, you know, if you're doing an acquisition or taking on a new product or new partnership, but do you, as you're laying out sort of the, the life of mine, the whole operation of the mine, and then are you seeing, oh, this is in our suite, these are where we have our gaps, and now you go out and try to fill it, or, or do you have an internal team that, that tries to develop something, a mixture of both, just sort of that nuts and bolts part of filling those gaps? It's a mixture of both. I think the way we took, we took a step back a couple of years ago and really went, you know, here's the technologies that we can provide, but 
what are we doing for our clients? And, and you know, we started to identify the different personas that we had in the mining industry. And so rather than look at it as, a, you know, here's just an FMS and here's just a planning tool, we started to say, you know, for the engineer on site, what does this mean? And how does this, you know, almost start to map out the full data flow for what that person needs from the day, the time they rock up to work to the mm. time that they go home. And you start to identify how, how each piece of this technology really interacts with them and the value that they can start to ascertain from different solutions. That really gave us a quick, it was a quick way for us to un- identify um, what those opportunities were for us and then be more targeted at the way that we were developing the solutions for them. Um, so that, that was probably the best, biggest way we went about it, yeah. Um, what I was going to, I was hoping you could unpack a little bit and I'm, I'm trying to sort of paint a picture for the audience of just the scale and and when a, the value proposition, because I think there's a lot of assumptions when we're talking about integrating technology and monitoring systems. And could you sort of break down the value proposition, one that you're offering, but also that the customers are demanding as well? Yeah. So I think the beauty of the power of one is, you know, we break it into the sort of three core areas that we focus on with the power of one. And that's about the, the devices on board and the ecosystem that we create. We look at the, um, the platform and the software that we use in the office. And then we have the cloud with analytics and, and what we're able to deliver from there from a value in terms of uh, smarter decision making. So we break it, if you go into the sensors on board, I mean, We've all seen it in the industry. You get into an excavator or into a truck and there's two to three screens um, all throwing in alarms or information at people. Um, and so it becomes a distraction and people are trying to do their jobs. We're all about how do we make their lives easier? And so by integrating three or four of these actual solutions on board, we're mm. making their lives easier. We're getting, giving them the right context at the right time so that they can make that decision faster and uh, more predictably and repeatably, I guess, is also an option that we look at. Um, And then that moves down into how do we service and support these, either the mine sites themselves or ours. Um, You know, now you've you've got only one computing box on there and one screen that you have to manage and maintain cables and everything else. And so the overhead of that comes down drastically. So across the board, there's kind of that win-win. and then obviously from a, you know, in the office, we look at what we're doing there and we're really consolidating the workflows. And when we look at those workflows, you have the block model. Well, let's say you take a drill and blast as an example. To be able to streamline the, the data flows uh, into the workflows from you know, the geological model, understanding where your ore is, how does the drill design actually influence that ore body through to the movement of that ore body um, and reconciling that before it's even dug back to the original block model, these sorts of workflows don't really exist. And so we're giving people a way to actually look at their data and be able to design and you know, really close the loop on some of these uh, processes just by having a standard software suite that people can use. Yeah. It also creates consistency for our people as well. So less uptime for training, um, you know, consistency in that usability, uh, which, you know, I think mining has been and always probably will continue to be quite a transient workforce. Um, and so, you know, if you can make the lives easier, the upskill time easier, that's a, a big bonus for the industry in general. Well, I think you just sold half the industry when you said it went from three screens to one. So I think that was, <laughs> we probably end the interview. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, but that that idea, this concept of a of a, because I saw I was reading some. Oh, I was watching a video, and it said many workflows, one answer. And I guess what came to my mind right away is that you've got, even on a management level, um, you're if, if you've got these different systems in place, it, it's not so different that if you've got an office with different <laughs> different operating systems. You've got people that, you know, a Mac or a PC, you know, that kind of thing. You've got people that communicate the same thing differently. That, it must just be, it must be a huge breakthrough for you to sit down, especially with these major operators that have so many workflows to say, no, we've actually narrowed this down. 
And in that stream, I wanted to clarify, when we're talking, are we talking about the drilling program, the haulage program, the crushing? How much are we, are we talking about the entire flow? That's the aim. So, I mean, at certain areas, we're going to be releasing things over the over duration, but the aim is to, for the life of your mine. Um, so exploration workflows into uh, geology, short-term, uh, tactical scheduling into long-term strategic, you know, operation material movement. So actually, and that's the one thing like that breaks it down. We've always traditionally talked about it as a mine planning space and a fleet management space and a crushing space. We shouldn't because if we want to do true uh, optimization across that full value chain, we've got to think about that as material movement. It's just at a different life, a journey in its life, whether right. you're doing tactical planning or it's getting crushed. But once we look at it as material movement, now suddenly we see opportunities in that process. What is the biggest challenge then when you're working with, with these major mine operators? Is What is the... Are they, is there a very clear demand for it, or is there a pretty still a, a fairly large educational aspect? Um, when you're trying, when you're, when you're going from three screens to one, you're, you're streamlining it clearly, but you're also just eliminated 66% of a workflow. <laughs> so, what, um, is that, is that a pretty, uh, can that get to be a pretty intense ongoing discussion when you're trying to? although you're adding, but you're also in some ways eliminating processes. No, because we're not eliminating the process. We're, we're enhancing it. So, you know, we, we look at, say, uh, fleet management with our reverse assist, uh, which, you know, enables the truck to um, spot under the excavator mm. much easier. We used, you could have two or three screens doing all of that, but now we've got the right context. So as the operator actually gets into position, the screens automatically switch smoothly with the same look and feel, the same um, sort of uh, messages back to them. And so it gives them better context as what's to do. So we're not actually eliminating that process at all. We're just really enhancing it, making it easier for the operator to consume that information um, on that front. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit too about the, the sort of this scale um, that you're, you're going to work at. So when you're dealing with clients now, the, the power of one is obviously this full scale, this full suite. Now, is there still a lot of work being in that sort of that integration part, partial, partial automation, partial censoring? Like where, where does it sort of land? Um, or I, I actually, I wanted to switch over to something first. The legacy systems. People that have, a, there's an operator, they have a certain setup now. What happens there when you're coming into a fully operational mine? Are you, are you integrating? Or are they replacing? Do they have to replace some equipment? What is sort of the system in the, those types of cases? Yeah, I guess every mine's unique, right? And every challenge is unique. Um, certainly, if they, they've got solutions, um, we want to look at creating that ecosystem and, and adding to that ecosystem if it makes sense. Um, if we have the technology and the process and that is easier and the overall value prop is better, then, yeah, we can replace um, and we're seeing that on a number of mines at the moment where, the, you know, the, the message of Power of One, I guess we launched this at uh, Mine Expo last year. Um, and yeah, it's resonated really, really well. Uh, we have some, some phone calls that, we, you know, coming through our door, we never thought we'd have. So um, it's been unbelievably well received. Um, and I think that's from top to bottom, from, you know, executive sea level all the way down to the truck drivers themselves. So. Is there some is there some sort of examples of uh, just going back to that that thing of sort of these replacing legacy um, systems? Are there some examples that sort of stand out to you as as where Hexagon has come in and is sort of integrated in and be able to replace some of these essentially the legacy uh, system they've had in place? Uh, yeah, there's a few. Um, I mean, we're doing a, a big push at the moment down in um, South America. Uh, I won't name names uh, on here, but, uh, you know, we are definitely coming in and, and looking to shake up the industry on, on what these technologies can do. So um, that comes with challenges. And I think the other piece of the power of one um, that is probably just as critical as the technology is the partnership piece that, that comes with this. And the only way that you can uh, either 
introduce technology from the ground up as a, a greenfield or or go in and replace legacy products on board or, and integrate with things is by truly understanding what the, the client's objectives are, what their pain points are, um, how we can help them do and make their lives better. Um, and I think that's a, a strong area that we continue to, to grow in and, and work in is, you know, how do we really partner up with the industry and, uh, and you know, put our hands up when we do things wrong and be accountable to it, but at the same time sharing the success when we actually get it right. How does that work when you've done, when you bring a technology in to an operating mine and now you're getting that fee, like, like, would you, does it come in 90% ready? Is it a hundred percent ready? Uh, what are your sort of your expectations of the integration? Um, are you, you're sort of anticipating and putting time there for new developments that are going to come based on the demands or is that part of it? When we go to a site, I mean, obviously we'll have you know, different release stages. So we'll, we'll have beta sites and, and, you know, thank you to all the sites out there that uh, enable us to do that. But because um, uh, you can't truly test anything until you actually get it in, right. in the hands of, of people, operators, right? Um, but I think we take product that's out that's ready. So, um, you know, there's certain structures and, and APIs and things like that, that we, to, for integration purposes that we can handle. And yes, we'll scope that out. We need to understand it clearly and articulate what we need to do um, and, you know, work with the customer to, for them to understand that as well. Um, and before we get on site, that's where I'd like to actually have all of that nutted out and worked out. But, uh, you know, obviously sometimes as spanners get thrown in the works every now and then and you've got to uh, be agile and work with our clients and our customers on what they're needing. But I like to use the analogy that we are, uh, configuration over customization. And I think that that's a scalable approach to being able to deliver solutions in the industry uh, that you know can grow not just from today but right into the future. That's an interesting thing to say because I think there's well we even found it on this show that when we first started we went there was a lot of customization talk um, and then we realized that's quite stressful for people. <laughs> Because yeah. they're not coming, you're not coming on our show to tell us how to do it. You want us to provide an infrastructure so that you can deliver the information that you feel is important. Is it a little bit the same? Do you think there has been an error in some developers where they've tried to make it too customizable for the customer rather than saying, this is the value, these are the steps we can take, and here's the value add? And, and making it, it's almost you can overcomplicate it by this customization sort of approach. Oh, 100%. I think um, there's not wrong to do it. It's just that, you know, right. sometimes you get pulled in certain directions and we've all been there and I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll all go there again. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you're on site, you're under pressure, you you, you want to, uh, you know, please the client, you want to get things done. Um, and so, but sometimes that can drive a, a culture that's, you know, not sustainable, not scalable is the right not word. Not scalable. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And if you can't scale it, then ultimately that client's not going to get the benefits of it all the right. other work you're going to do for all the other the customers around the world, right? Because they're stuck on this version of the product that's three, four, five years old or whatever, because mm. the cost to upgrade is just way too high. And so we want to continue to work with our clients and give them the best technology that's available today and keep them going on that because then they get the best value out of the solution that they've paid for. Well, I guess there's also the temptation. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this where you see one error or one thing that's a specific challenge that the client is having, and there's sort of this temptation to then start relooking at it across the board, and you can kind of end up on these on these on these sort of rabbit trails, and and you sort of have to. I guess that's part probably part of your role is sort of st staying in focus and not letting sort of filtering out. Say, okay, there's a consistent challenge here that now we need to address, rather than oh, there's one challenge. Okay, we need to change it across the board. Yeah, I look at and I came from a startup, right? So I get it. Like you chase, uh, you know, revenue and go down different rabbit holes, and um, you know, just to keep the lights on sometimes. Yeah. Um, but at a certain size, that again, it all comes back to that scalability point. Yeah, uh, if, you know, you've got to really understand what your focus is, what you're trying to achieve for your your business, for your client, and then um, see how you can take that out to the world at a global scale. If you can think about it from a globe, global point of view down to the, the site that you're on, 
um, you're always going to ensure that you can, you know, have that scalable solution. Okay, I wanted to uh, touch on sort of that it, from a greenfield perspective. Um, this is far beyond my pay grade, and so I'm quite interested to sort of, uh, and if we could get the audience to sort of take a look at what it, what does it take? You talk about the power of one from day one. It's it's a greenfield project. You're going to be from the ground up. Where does that, under the assumption you're already working with the, the client, just the design and bringing in the technology and which to technology to integrate and what, can you just talk us through that that process? Yeah, uh, for sure. So I guess it start, all starts with a conversation with the client at the very beginning of the process to say, you know, what are your pain points? What are you wanting to achieve? And, you know, ultimately by when? Because um, you usually get some pretty fixed and hard dates from clients on when they're going to have startup and, uh, you know, great break ground and these sorts of things. Um, and then it's all about how do we map that out from there? So, you know, the ideal is when you, you, you get your trucks uh, or all your equipment, you, you don't want to have that parked up for long. Right, so ability for us to be able to get in and install the one computer, the one screen, one antenna, um, you know, really sets the foundation for us then to go forward. And basically from that point, you know, let's say we roll out the FMS with that particular configuration or our operator alert solution from that particular uh, hardware configuration, everything else we can start to turn on by software and really start to enable operations to sort of scale up and down um, what the, the technology actually is that they're using on site. And so, you know, that's, they're able to consume it on site at their pace uh, and the change that they require. So that's, you know, I guess probably that's a little bit more on the incremental side of things, but, um, you know, for ability to come in and do the big bang as well and sort of say, well, here's how our your material movement is going to work and here's how drill and blast works uh, from end to end from the point where you you know you, you take your, your geological model all the way through to the blasting aspect and even you know further down the path with fragmentation um, which you know feeds into the crusher mm -hmm. um, and, and the costs that come associated with that I think it um, it really enables us to to look big picture with the client and find what they're real pain points are what is your i was curious about your role in this type of process like if it's a major mine and it's a, a it's a, at the greenfield stage or, or even just a fully operated one of these large operators and you're integrating are you are you directly there or are you are you sort of the middle ground just in your your own personal role that middle ground between the technology that's that's developed and being and ready to go into the field and the customer that's taking on this what sort of your role do you what's the role that you play in it yeah i love getting out in the mines and getting my boots dirty right so any chance i get i get out there but no we've, we've got a um fantastic team uh, all around the world um so we really probably you know four or five years ago um made the decision to be local and really be close to our customers and so we have you know services groups all around the world um, that go out, work with our clients on a daily basis. Some are actually embedded into their teams uh, on a daily basis. And we, we work closely with them on, you know, again, pain points, solutions, um, you know, doing all that sort of discovery sessions with them. Um, and then from there, we also have our product management group, which kind of you know, works under me. They come in and they uh, understand what those pains are and translate that into you know, what solutions do we need to do? Do we need to improve a particular solution or is it a whole new game changer that we need to think about? Um, and then we kind of go from there, uh, how we roll it out. But um, yeah, we've got our core tech stack that you know, covers the majority of those sorts of uh, uh, operations. What about, uh, and company scope, I mean, you're, you're operating on a global scale. I've, you know, I've, I've, I know companies that you, you directly work with. Um, can you just sort of give us that that scope of not only how far Hexagon reaches, but also how um, they reach on a global scale? Uh, I think we're in about 2,000 mines around the world from wow. memory. 
Um, so pretty much all the, the top mining companies around the world, we have one way, shape or form, they would have a part of Hexagon technology on there. Um, so we have, you know, 40 offices around the world. Um, we have a, a significant service support group um, around there. Um, so I guess all the open pit or underground focused as well and dedicated to those sorts of areas within mining. Um, I, I just took note during the interview that you use the term partner um, when you're talking about customers that you're servicing. And I just thought I would talk, I was reading through your values actually before the show started. And uh, by the way, whoever de uh, designed your values and, and mission is uh, good on them. It's very clear. And uh, one of my favorite ones, <laughs> which I, I drives me nuts when companies don't have something like this is profit driven. <laughs> That's it. Yep. It's like, please be honest with me. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people it, it can put them off too, right? Because a lot of people yep. don't necessarily understand what we mean by that. Um, and it's about us being here for the long run and being, right. you, know, you, you want a partner, you want someone who's going to be there with you for the journey. You know, a lot of our minds are 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the, uh, for operations and so you know to partner up with us today means we're going to be there tomorrow yeah and it and it and it, it gives that longevity also what one thing that that you know you, you you might lose a customer because that's in there okay you lose one but you'll gain 10 other ones because when you're thinking in, when a company knows you think in that longevity they know that you'll they'll get or more likely to get an honest answer because uh, just, just as an example, I had a, we had a large client of ours and I had to give them some bad data about their second, the second episode they'd done. <laughs> I didn't, you don't want to, but I know if I don't, they, they're not going to improve and do it the right way, the third or the fourth or the fifth time. Um, and so do you find, and going, again, going back to those values, with it being so clear, and I, I'm going to put a link to that because I think people should go to see it, you know, uh, profit-driven, engaged, professional, innovative, customer-focused. It's so crisp that I, I feel like when somebody, I, I certainly had an effect on me when I was working with you, there is just this clarity with Hexagon from what I see. And, and do, you, do you see that that quickly transfers over to your customers and they just, they sort of know what they're getting when, they, when you walk through the door? Yeah, definitely. It's an evolution too, right? I think, you know, historically we can put our hands up and say, well, you know, hindsight's a beautiful thing and we can look back and say, have we always done the right thing? Maybe not. Um, we strive to 100% always serve our customers in the best possible way. And those values really do help drive our culture and, our, and what we are all about. Um, I think that, that comes down to then how do we work with our clients on a day-to-day -day basis? And, you know, you alluded to the fact that we use that word partner quite mm -hmm. a lot. And it is because, you know, we all in a, in a project, in an operation, we're all there to do the right thing. And that is to make the mining industry better, you know, make money, get people home safely every night mm -hmm. and do it more efficiently. Right. But we've got to learn and understand that, you know, we make those mistakes, the, the clients make mistakes, but how do we work together to make sure that we still succeed as a, as a team and as a project. And that's, you know, for us, that's really working closely with our clients um, into that partnership mode, uh, understanding what their values are, understanding what their needs, wants, desires are, and then how do we help them? Another big thing is saying, no, we can't. Like if we can't help you in certain things, that's okay. We can either help facilitate or just know we can't. And I think, you know, a lot of the times, a lot of companies can get stuck up on that because they want to just do everything. Mm -hmm. but, but sometimes saying no is actually the healthiest thing. Is that power of one, though? Um, I, I It sounds like I'm doing a shameless plug, but it's a genuine <laughs> question. That power of one, though, is that eliminating some of that no, that, that those times to say no, because that work has been done since 2015, to have this multi multi-dimensional offering that you're not just stuck in sort of this this little little box within a certain system. Definitely helping, but you know we're we are realists and we understand that we don't do everything. Um, I hope one day we could say that we are, but I think you know technology evolves so fast um, that we were never just going to be able to do everything. So 
uh, our ability to be able to create those partnerships with technology, other technology vendors or OEMs out there to really be able to close those gaps um, is what helps drive us forward on that front. Uh, um, or we look to develop that ourselves if we need to on there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not asking for a, a two or 10 year prediction or anything like that. But when you're looking at the industry, you know, in the, in the job title that you have, in the type of company that you're with, and, and just having sort of that front row seat, I mean, are we going towards a mine that's got, you know, there's uh, there's 50 people running the, the operation and, and all those, <laughs> there, there's actually no people down in there working or, or how far are we from that? What do, what do you see, you know, not a timeline, it might be 100 years from now. Is there yeah. is there a way forward that that could happen one day? Yeah, think? I definitely think so. Um, you know, I don't think it's about reducing the numbers of people on site. I think it's about eliminating them from the you know, dangerous areas. And mm -hmm. we're still going to need a big workforce. It's just there's going to be a different uh, skill set. Um, but yes, I think we are continuing to, as an industry, remove people from those hazardous areas. And we want to continue doing that. Uh, timeline predictions, yeah, that's a tough one. You know, you, <laughs> that's you, a tough one. Yeah, you look at you look at the iPhone was only out what 15 years ago, and what that's done to uh, the amount of data that we we now generate. I think I heard a stat the other day, and probably don't quote me on it, but we generate now in the, uh, one day more than we've ever created from yesterday back to all time in terms yeah. of data. And so it's just that's all growing exponentially, and the opportunities that it's going to come out of that is it's very hard to predict. Um, so I think, you know, automation, um, not just from self, uh, like from um, driverless trucks and, and other equipment, but also automation into the decision-making process is, right. Yeah. that's the big one. I think that's where we want to unlock the value for a lot of operations. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate enough uh, with the power of one that we have a unbelievable amount of data that we can generate from planning through to ops to safety automation the sensors that we have out there that is coming back um, you know the trick for us is, is how do we actually enable our users to use that better i, I was just curious you've had uh, you know uh, we've again a lot of people have come on the show and talked about you know the need to find good people and that is there is it for what you're doing um I, i'm sure you're expanding and bringing on new team members is there are, are you noticing uh, there's a lot of talk about people trying to kind of attract the next generation? I mean, I, I would imagine a company that's doing what you're doing, which is sort of the cutting edge of the mining industry. Um, is it a little bit easier for you to attract, uh, you know, the sort of, sort of the youth to, to your company as, as opposed to some companies are struggling because it's sort of, they're kind of built on a legacy system. Um, yeah. I mean, it's still a challenge, right? We, Take, I guess what we do, and it's something we debate all the time. Are we a mining company with technology? Are we a technology company in mining? Mm. Or are we just a technology company? Hmm. And those statements really do help and, and uh, reflect, you know, what we stand for, what, who we are, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, you know, next generation of people coming through really look at that. It's a high on their um, employee desire or employee of choice, right? Is to they want to do good. They want to be yeah. in that world. They want to, um, you know, change the world. And sometimes mining gets a little bit of a um, you know, bad rap, but this is where you can make the biggest biggest change, and you can really truly change an industry and and make it better. And I think the impact there is huge. And so I think. Yes, we, we can, you know, the brand definitely helps us. Uh, um, where, whether or not I can say that we can do it better than anyone else out there, I, I don't know enough. You're allowed to say it on this show. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I think everyone's got challenges. And I yeah, think as, a, as an industry, yeah. and that's not just us in the mining tech, but across the board, I think, you know, we've got to rebrand ourselves as to doing good for the planet and doing, you know, doing it well. I think we can. Well, I was uh, and just just staying in sort of that that youth vein for um, a minute. I saw I was reading one article. I don't want to throw too many things random at you, but I was reading um, that you've actually been working with universities, developing a pro, like programs to actually train people in this sort of thing. I mean, how how much of a focus is that um, sort of laying that groundwork 
for the next generation um, of people coming in to be able to then push it to another level. Yeah, we, we find it really important for us. Like, um, and that's why we invested with uh, the U of A in that particular course. So, um, you know, we can put people through that both internally uh, as they come through and work with Hexagon, but also externally, they get a visibility into who we are and at an early stage. And I think that really helps people understand what the industry is about what we're about and how we want to go about it. And that, um, you know, opens up a lot of doors. But then you've got to go through that next level as well. You know, you've got to have the, the grad programs. You've got to empower people to come in and, and really learn. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we're working through that constantly to see how can we do that better. And I think uh, it's important for us as a, as a group to be able to find that next generation of, of people coming through our business. It's, it's, it's an exciting time. I know just even for me starting to do these interviews a few years ago, just the shift from, and the progress, well, you talked about like daily, the amount of data. I mean, the progress just in the last few years has been unbelievable. You know, it went from people were talking a little bit about ore sorting to, I mean, now the conversations I've had, it just keeps going up and up. And I, I feel I'm just trying to keep up half the time now. On these interviews. Tell me about it. Like yourself. So <laughs> I do appreciate you coming on. You know, I, I hope it's not the last time, you know, some of these clients you're working with, it would be amazing one day to, to sit down with you and maybe them and actually kind of talk about that holistic approach from their side and yours. And there's just, I mean, we could do 20 episodes and not even begin to cover it. So I, I really do appreciate you coming on Rob and, and talking about it. No, likewise. It's great. I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for watching this episode of Mining Now. Thank you to Rob Daw from Hexagon for joining the show. Um, like I said to him, there's so much to cover that, that it's like it's like we're just like started at the very start and, and hopefully at some point we get to sort of unpack even more. Please keep suggesting guests. Please keep watching, uh, telling us how we can do better. And thank you to our sponsors. Make sure to go to cim.org to check out uh, the uh, conference and expo that's coming up. It's going to be a great, uh, a great event here in Vancouver. Please keep watching. See you on the next episode of Mining Now.